everyone, and welcome to another episode of Story Stalking, brought to you by Dead to Rights in conjunction with Carrick Publishing. I'm your host, Donna Carrick. Today I'm going to be reading to you from this lovely anthology of crime stories titled In the Key of Thirteen by the Maydams of Mayhem, which came out from Carrick Publishing in 2019. And the story I'm going to bring you today is the fourth story in this anthology titled Hit Me With Your Pet Shark by the very effervescent writer Lisa De Nicholas. If you're not familiar with her work, I recommend you look up Rotten Peaches or The Witch Doctor's Bones or any of her absolutely wonderful stories, um, uh, novels and short stories as well. She's had a short story in several of our anthologies and they're all really highly acclaimed. So look for Lisa De Nicholas and you're gonna find somebody really different. Uh, Lisa brings a unique voice to writing crime, so I hope you'll enjoy. And now I'm going to bring you her story, Hit Me With Your Pet Shark. As you may or may not know, the theme of the anthology in the Key of 13 was music and murder. So Lisa plays on titles and lyrics of songs in this story. Hit Me With Your Pet Shark by Lisa De Nicholas. The day the music died, Dad came to mind. Stum, he said. Keep stum. If you get into hot water, don't say a word. So I stared at the cop and kept it zipped. I looked away from the blood-stained hoodie. I looked away from the butcher's knife. And I shrugged. Rewind two weeks to the start of a holiday of a lifetime. Yep. Cokehead loser me, up to my eyeballs in debt, and there I was, living it up in Key West, thanks to my brand new buddy Joe, who also happened to be my boss. That was one strange job interview. He didn't make eye contact the whole time. He stared over my shoulder. Like he was eyeing the ghost of some dead relative, and he had a twist of a half smile that made me want to belt him across the face. But whatever, he hired me, and I counted myself lucky. I was 24 with not too many prospects in life. My dad, a small square man with a mashed potato face and a heart of gold, died all of a sudden, leaving a great big hole in my life. Mom, and I use the word loosely, had, as dad put it, scarpered off as soon as she got shot of me. She kicked the bucket a few years later, but I couldn't have cared less. Dad was all I needed, and then he was gone. And gone, too, were his love of punk rockers, the toasty tang of his unfiltered fags, his take-no-shit brandies that flowed like blood in his veins, his deep belly laugh, and a hug when I needed it most. I couldn't keep the house because it turned out dad wasn't so stellar with money. A garage mechanic with grease under his fingernails, he had a tendency to lose jobs more than he kept them, which is most likely where I got the gene. Peas in a pod, dad and me. Dad knew I liked to mix my science, as he put it. But be Johnny Rotten, he said, a survivor, not Sid Vicious, poor mutt. You can get in too deep before you know it. Keep it to a minimum, which I had to do anyway since I was always skint. Teachers said I was clever enough. I was good with numbers and I aced accounting school, but I just couldn't go to work every day. Dad understood. He told me not to be too hard on myself. We were free spirits was all. It was the world that was out of whack, too demanding. It was his dad, Gramps, who named me Christine Ellen after Chrissy Hind. The London punk rock scene in 1977, that was Gramps' heyday. He was only 19 when he fell for a Canadian girl, a punk rock groupie back when Malcolm McLaren and Vivian Westwood were all the rage. Granny got into drugs when she was a teen, and her family sent her to an aunt in London to spend a summer and clean up her act, which worked on one level, but not on another. When his sweetheart got a bun in the oven, Gramps married her and came to Canada with her to set up house in a small town just outside of Toronto. 
They built solid lives with Gramps working in a factory and Gran a stay-at-home mom. Gramps was as British as Bovril, though, and he never let us forget it. In turn, we copied his slang and whatnot. I knew people laughed at us, but we were proud of our British heritage. Gramps sounded like he came right out of lock stock and two smoking barrels, or vintage Michael Caine, saying no bother and taking the piss. I thought talking like a Brit made me sound exotic, although it annoyed the crap out of my teachers, which made it even more worthy. As it does, history repeated itself, and Mom and Dad had me when Dad was only 19 himself. Mom was hardly 16, and she popped me out and ran off with a small-time pop rocker from Vancouver, who was in town to play the Peach Festival. Mom died of a heroin overdose when I was seven, and the only proof I've got of her existence is a single faded Polaroid, with her looking small and pale, with Cleopatra eyes and wild black hair. She was pretty, while I got Dad's features, born looking like I'd been in a bare-knuckle fight in the womb. It wasn't fair. Mom was like a kitten, all tiny and fluffy and cuddly, and I could have hated her for that, if I'd been bothered. Dad was only 41 when he died. Too many fags and a bad heart to start with. He said Brandy kept his veins flowing clear, but it turned out he was dead wrong about that. He inherited his love of punk from Gramps. He said that while he had at least passed his love of music on to me, God only knew where my taste came from. Abba? He said that must have been from some defective gene on my mother's side. But my love for Iggy Pop, the Sisters of Mercy, and T-Rex redeemed me. Here comes Johnny, here again, hey now, hey now, now, and sing a song, have a bong, get it on. We listen to music together all the time, vinyl all the way. Dad never called me Christine Ellen or Chrissy. He said I was his Christelle, but I hated that name. After Dad died, I told people to call me Ellie, which I thought was much more suave. So, anyway, the job at Joe's was a low-level affair, a piece of cake, and, bonus, I got to listen to my music all day, one playlist after another. No one cared. I had four iPods, a touch, a shuffle, a nano, and a mini, with thousands of songs, and earphones with extra bass. I filled spreadsheets on autopilot, working as a temp to log in expenses and such, while the usual girl took a break. A break from what, I wondered. But no one said, and I didn't ask. I thought a video production firm would be super glam, and that they'd have hard candy lied up on the coffee tables for all of us to share. But no such luck. They were a bunch of geeks, and Joe was just about the geekiest of the lot. At least I thought so, until I saw him in front of me in the lineup in the alley behind the local Greasy Spoon. And I don't mean him or me wanted coffee or pie. I was there to meet my dealer. I wasn't overly surprised to see that Joe liked his candy, too. He looked horrified to see me, and his pretty boy face went this scarlet color, like a rash had suddenly covered him. But so what? I didn't care what he did in his spare time. If anything, he went up in my estimation. If I was Joe, I would have left without making eye contact, but he let me do my business. Then he beckoned me over. He was my boss. I had to go. I sat across from him in a booth inside the diner with the little bag of blow in my pocket, wondering why I didn't feel happier. What with the promise of good times right there at my fingertips, I should have been but I just felt lonely, like the weight of the world's sorrows were locked inside my chest. I couldn't breathe, and I closed my eyes, not caring what Joe thought. Then Dancing Queen came on the jukebox, and the solid gray rocks inside me burst apart as if they'd exploded in an old video game. I opened my eyes and looked squarely at Joe. I love ABBA, I said. And Joe twisted his half-smile just that much more. Who doesn't, he replied easily. What do you listen to, I asked, feeling the need to try my hand at small talk. Joe waved his hand around vaguely. Hip-hop, Drake, 
Kanye, the usual suspects. I shuddered. You wouldn't like my playlists, I said. I've got stacks of music, 80s stuff mainly. See the beam on the tangerine, oh yeah, I sang out loud, and Joe looked perplexed. Those aren't the words, he said. What a dick. I shrugged. So what? I forgot to be polite. I sing what I like. I shrug a lot. It used to drive the teachers nuts at school. I got detentions for shrugging, but since when is shrugging a crime? Dad told me I needed to learn to be more socially interactive. I told him the trouble with being socially interactive was that it made me want to hit people. Dad didn't know what to say to that. You enjoying work, Joe asked. I started to shrug, but I forced myself to be more socially interactive and told him it was okay. Dancing Queen ended and some rap shit came on about a guy eating sushi from Japan and wanting to kick Jackie Chan, like that's music. I suppose it was the kind of crap that Joe liked. Joe looked at me steadily and didn't say anything. I picked at my fingernails. He was wasting my time when I could be getting high. I started to get up, but Joe picked up his phone. Hang on a moment, he said to me, and he waved me back down. I zoned out while he talked. More Than a Feeling by Boston came on. I love that song. More than a feeling, I keep believing. I see my love leaving. I heard Joe say, there's someone you'd like to meet from what we were talking about. Then he put down his phone and I dragged my focus back to him. You wanna to come to a party? He asked. I was startled. I'm not so great at parties. Joe gestured to our mutual dealer who was sitting across the room eating a cheeseburger. That kind of party. Oh, okay, yeah, sure. I followed him outside to a brand new Mini Cooper. I got in and breathed the scent of fresh leather. Nice, I said, straight out of the box. I was twittering like a budgie because I was really nervous, saying stuff about how great the car was and how I could fix it if something went wrong. I was good with cars, even the new ones. Joe gave me a strange look. I shut up and stared out the window. We got to a shiny new skyscraper and we rode up 56 floors to Joe's condo in silence, with me trying not to look at my reflection in the floor to ceiling mirrors. Only rich and thin people want mirrors in their elevators. I'm happier with scratched beige plywood and graffiti like Patty Licks Kim. Joe opened the front door and I tried to hide how impressed I was by the black leather, the glass, the steel, the wood, and the marble. But I froze. I didn't belong here. The sun was low and the city glittered below us, a stretch of cubic zirconia in the hot summer haze. Dad had always said I was like a little magpie, addicted to sparkle. But this was too much, even for me. Joe held out his hand. Give me one of your iPods, he said. I shook my head. People laugh at my music. Joe laughed. He had a weird laugh like Beavis and Butthead put together. He kept his hand outstretched. I sighed and dug out the iPod and he plugged it into his surround sound Boise system. The bass notes of Bananarama's Venus remix thudded in the room, and Joe looked startled. I told you, I said. I like it, he protested. Come on, let's get this party started. He laid out a few lines and helped himself. Then he gestured to me and I dived right in. He cracked open a bottle of vodka and we each had a shot. Hot peace hit my veins and I helped myself to another shot, filled to the brim. Paranoid by Black Sabbath was up next, and it seemed that Joe and I found common ground. We started dancing. He looked like a skinny kangaroo, trying to keep time that made sense only to him, and I thought that maybe he wasn't so bad after all. Then the doorbell rang, and Joe went to get it while I was pogoing around and singing, ay, 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 woe, ma, 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 my corona, to the knack at the top of my voice. 
I spun around and stopped dead. Talk about humiliating. I stared at the floor, sneaking glances and pulling down my ratty old hoodie, hating Joe for letting a girl like that see me like this. This girl was Bambi in see-through white chiffon, her black bra and panties like the shadows of a wet dream. She sparkled from her dangling earrings down to her silver high-heeled strappy sandals. Looking at her was like staring into the sun. Joe waved his hand to make the introductions. Ellie, meet Emma. Emma, Ellie. I grunted, rooted in place. Emma flashed a ridiculously perfect smile in my direction and floated to lean over the glass table. She had a perfect round apple of a bum. I forced myself to look away. Who's that girl by the Eurythmics wailed through the speakers, hitting the nail on the head. I'm tongue-tied and twisted. There's a price I'll have to pay. Emma patted the sofa and beckoned to me. I was still standing there, the village idiot. I forced myself to move, a muddy moth drawn to a golden flame. Emma reached up and pulled me down next to her. I lost my balance, nearly falling on top of her. An electric current jolted me. Flushing with embarrassment, I tried to shift to a more graceful position. She handed me the snorter, and I took it with trembling fingers. I vacuumed a line. Joe handed me another shot, and I threw it back. Thank God for Goldfrapp's strict machine. Thud, thud, thud. The bass helped calm me a bit, but I was a cornered mouse. I saw Joe watching me, and there was a look in his lizard eyes that told me to run away, run as fast as I could. But cool fingertips brushed my neck, and I closed my eyes, trapped by pleasure, a dumb creature unable to move. The sofa took the weight of another body, and I opened my eyes to see Emma rubbing Joe's balls. I thought, okay, so that's how it's going to be. When I woke up hours later, there was silence and darkness and the soft sounds of Joe and Emma passed out or asleep. I knew not to push my luck. Dad always told me the smartest thing you can do is know when to walk away. I grabbed my iPod and snuck out of the apartment. Monday came, and Joe wasn't any different to me in front of the others. I was back to being invisible Ellie, just there to crunch numbers. But Tuesday rolled around, and he texted me to come to his office. Want to come to Key West with Emma and me? My mouth dropped open. I thought he was going to fire me. In two weeks, for two weeks, I'm the boss here. Vacays, no problem. I leapt at the chance before Joe could change his mind. Yeah, that would be cool. Sure. Your passport's good? No, but I'll get one now. I mean, please, can I go get one now? Do you mind? Joe grinned. Go. Pay extra. Get it done. I listened to Grace Jones' Island Life on the plane ride sharing an earbud with Emma and smiling at her all the way through, pull up to the bumper. My mother will be there, Emma had told me. She parties in her own way. Valium, Xanax, codeine, booze. She likes to take the edge off. She doesn't care if I have fun. It's my father who's the asshole. Slow down, Emma. Go to rehab, Emma. Get a real job. Grow up. He stopped my allowance. Can you believe that? What does he expect me to do? He's even cut me out of the will, the bastard. Well, screw him. But my mom's okay, you'll see. Something weird happened in my life and my family fell apart. So none of this is my fault. I had no idea what she was talking about and I didn't want to pry. When I met her mother, it was 10 a.m. Marilyn was gripping a juice tumbler three quarters filled with scotch, hold the rocks, Hold the water. She was reclining on the sofa in a large satin chartreuse muumuu with animal prints. She extended her hand like Marlon Brando in drag, playing the Queen of England, holding court as Emma and Joe watched. You could get lost in this house and no one would ever find you, I said to her, and she smiled. 
It's modeled on our family cottage in the Bruce Peninsula, she said, with an accent that sounded strangely Southern. My husband and I wanted identical places in both locales, right down to the de decor. It was such fun making little twin houses. Then we split up and he got Canada and I took the keys. We were never divorced, she said pointedly, although I didn't care. I am and always will be his wife. He likes to forget it, but I'm the one with the money. He's lucky I didn't cut him right off. All the money he says he's made, he made on my money. He was nothing. He had nothing. He'd still be nothing without me. She spat the words at me, her eyes watering and her chin wobbling, but her drinking hand remained steady. Don't bore Ellie with the intricacies of our family mess, Emma said, but I think you two share the same taste in music. Get your iPod, Ellie. Let's have some fun. I plugged in a playlist. Pat Benatar blasted through the house and Marilyn laughed and sat up straighter. I like you, girly, she said. Ellie's got her own lyrics, Emma said, and I thought I heard a mocking note in her voice. What do you sing to this one? Hit me with your pet shark? Fry her filet? I blushed. Something like that. I closed my hand around the tattoo on the inside of my wrist. A shark face, teeth bared inside a red heart, with Dad Loves Me inscripted in the scroll. I got it after Dad died because he had loved this song too, and sometimes he called me his little pet shark. He never got the words right either, and him and me would make up the craziest things, trying to outdo each other. Joe shot a look at Emma, and she put her arm around me. Only joking, sweetie pop, I think you're adorable. Adorable? My heart burst like toffee exploding in my mouth. Marilyn hauled herself off the couch. I'm going to soak in the hot tub outside, she said, and she looked at me. Come and join me, Bonnie. Ellie, I said. Thank you. I'll go and put on my swimsuit. I ran upstairs, and when I came back down, I was shocked to see Joe and Emma freebasing Coke. Freebasing? That was just stupid. Joe offered me the pipe, and I shook my head. I didn't know you two did that, I said, feeling stupid, just like all those other times at school when I got some fundamental principle wrong. And here I was again, alone and lost on the playground, while the cool kids partied without me. Joe took another deep drag, and then he looked at me, his eyes unfocused. Emma came over and pinched my nipple hard, the way she knows I like it. Don't you worry, baby girl, she said. You don't have to do anything you don't want to. I do want to, I said. My groin felt hot and tight at the thought of something new and dangerous. Joe fired up his lighter and held it under the pipe and passed it to me. I inhaled and it was like all the lights in the world turned on at the same time. Holy shit, I said. Well, okay. Emma pulled me down onto the thick carpet undoing the straps of my bikini, and Joe pulled off his shirt. I wondered about Marilyn sitting in the hot tub, getting all mellow on her breakfast scotch, but I didn't think about her for long. Later, I ambled out to find Marilyn, who was still in the tub. I hope you two youngsters won't be too bored here, she said languidly, and I noticed that she kept sliding down, her chin bobbing against the water, and her eyes closing. I wondered what would happen if she dozed off. Would her survival instincts wake her, or would she drown? I think we'll be okay, I said, the drug and the sex still tingling in my body. I sat in the tub with Marilyn for a while, but I already wanted another hit. I went back inside to share another pipe. Suddenly, it was dark, and I lost track of time. We moved the party to a huge sunken living room, sofas curving around the walls and a giant TV set up high. The room felt isolated from the rest of the house and Marilyn was nowhere to be seen. It was like she wasn't even there. Welcome to paradise, Emma said. We'll live here forever. Goodbye, cruel world. Goodbye. Find us a song, Ellie. 
Just like heaven by the cure was an easy choice, followed by damn I wish I was your lover by Sophie B. Hawkins. I melt with you by modern English, hot stuff by the pussycat dolls, do you love me by Nick Cave and the bad seeds, white flag by ditto, daddy cool by Boney M, African wake by Johnny Osborne, Fade Into You by Mazzy Star and Bang Bang My Baby Shot Me Down by Nancy Sinatra. I DJed like there was no tomorrow, all my faves. It was like I had died and gone to heaven. We partied for a couple of days. I never wanted to leave the house, but Emma got restless. Let's go into town for dinner, she said. I was happy to lie on the couch, ordering takeout, switching songs and doing exactly what we were doing. But Emma was the boss. Should we invite Marilyn, I asked. We saw Marilyn from time to time, all of us soused in our own ways, no one questioning any of the others. Emma shook her head. She's happy out there in her tub. We got gussied up, and me, her, and Joe walked into town. I loved it when Emma dressed me up. Before we left for the holidays, she got me a makeover, and I had an expensive hairdo with highlights and lowlights and bangs that Emma told me were sexy. She told me I looked a little bit like Sandra Bullock when she was super young, which was a good thing, but added that I could stand to lose 30 pounds and that she'd help me with that. It wasn't far into town, but I wished we'd get a cab. My feet were killing me in those sparkly high heels, but I didn't want to make a fuss. I tried not to limp as blisters formed and the straps cut into my skin like red hot steel wire. I was so happy when we got to the restaurant and I sank down into my chair. We were out on the patio, tiny lights twinkling like stars were looped on the beams overhead. Hello, Space Boy by Bowie came through the speakers, and I couldn't have picked a better song. Emma ordered a pitcher of margaritas and a platter of nachos. I was halfway through my second margarita when I heard Emma gasp and sit bolt upright. It's Julia, she nudged Joe so hard he swallowed his drink the wrong way. I swear it's Julia. Look, Joe. Joe coughed and looked where she was pointing. Yeah, could be, who knows? They were both looking at a girl who was starting to walk away. I know it's her. Emma pushed her chair back and rushed after the girl who had disappeared. Who's Julia? I asked. I felt sick. Was she another lover? Julia is a story about statutory rape or true love, depending on your point of view, Joe said. Julia was Emma's best friend. They were together from the time they were babies. Then, when Julia was 13, she and Emma's father fell in love. Emma doesn't know that, by the way, so don't tell her. I only know because Marilyn told me. Why would Marilyn tell you, I asked. She was drunk one night. Not that that's unusual, but she was also screwing me. Something she had done from time to time, from when I was about 15. Ugh, I said, thinking of Marilyn's saggy wrinkles. She was way younger then, Joe said defensively. Then what happened? Julia went to Marilyn and told her that she and Eddie were in love and that they had been for two years. Julia was 15 by this time. And Emma had no idea, I asked. No idea. Must have been half the fun, all the secrecy. Julia tells Marilyn that she and Eddie want to get married as soon as she's old enough. She says Eddie's afraid of Marilyn, and that's why she had to tell her. Joe poured himself another margarita. So Marilyn threatens to have Eddie arrested for rape. She tells him she will never divorce him. They were high school sweethearts, and she said she would never let him leave her. And remember, the money was all hers. Her family was into home hardware, millionaires. Why did she divorce him? I asked. She didn't want him to be happy with Julia. Then Marilyn got Julia's parents involved. They weren't rich like Marilyn and Eddie, so they got paid off to move away. Emma was told that Julia's father had been transferred to Alaska 
and Julia wrote a long letter to say she'd be in touch. But, of course, she just disappeared. It really messed up Emma. Julia was suddenly gone. Her mother came to live here, and her father was like the king of Mope because he had lost his princess. Marilyn left Emma with her dad? But why? She wanted her to finish school. The thing is, Marilyn loved Eddie, right? She was heartbroken. She got rid of Julia, but she had lost him, so she left. She couldn't have been that in love with him since she was banging you. That was just sex. Eddie loved Julia, Marilyn loved Eddie, and Emma loved Julia. It was all such a mess. Marilyn came here and camped out in the hot tub with her scotch and her tranks and blew up like a whale. Emma waited for Julia to write, which never happened. Joe ordered another pitcher and got me another platter of nachos. He had just picked up one nacho while I had somehow devoured the entire platter. I was furious with myself. I had been hoping that all the drugs would help me lose weight, and to a degree they had. I was smaller than before, but I was still about four times bigger than Emma. No wonder she wasn't in love with me. It was amazing that she had even found me attractive. Emma came back and slumped into her chair, out of breath and her eyes wide. You okay? I asked. I wanted to put my arm around her, but she shrugged me off. A friend, she said. I thought I saw my best friend. I ran all over the place trying to find her. She started crying and I topped up her drink and she downed it in one go. Are you sure it was her, I asked, and Emma nodded. Let's go home, I said, but Joe shook his head. We need to go dancing, he said. Emma agreed. Yeah, right, let's hit a club. Show Ellie a good time. We shared a quick pipe in the alley, and then we hit the club, its name lit up in green and white lights. Heaven. All your kind of music, Emma said. She sounded annoyed, but I had no idea what I'd done to piss her off. The club was great, but Emma was subdued. She hung back while I danced with Joe, who did his kangaroo thing to Born Slippy by Underworld. One of the best songs ever, but I was miserable to my bones and my feet were killing me. But who cared about my feet? My heart was broken. I was head over heels in love with Emma. And sometimes I thought she didn't even like me. All I wanted was to go back to the house, but Emma and Joe insisted we stay. I threw back shot after shot, and Emma and me did vast amount of drugs in the washroom. I tried to make out with her, but she wasn't into it. I'm sorry, she said. My libido's left the building, but it'll come back, sweetie pop. I'm sorry. I told her it wasn't a problem, but I was sure her lack of desire for me was because I had eaten all the nachos and was just a fat slob. I hated Julia, whoever she was, for ruining everything. By the time we staggered out, it was dawn, and I couldn't think straight. None of us talked on the way home, and thank God we got a cab. Hard to imagine, but we were totally partied out, and we went straight to our rooms to crash. I face-planted into my pillow. I was still wearing the silver strappy sandals. There was blood around my ankles and toes from the blisters that had rubbed raw, but I couldn't feel anything. I was also still wearing the tight-fitting sequin dress that Emma had bought for me at the Nordstrom rack. It cost a fortune, but I didn't care. I would have slept for a week if it wasn't for the screaming in my dream, the screaming that went on and on like a four-alarm fire on a Sunday. I pulled myself awake, but the screaming didn't stop. I got up, unsteady on those heels, my feet throbbing. I had to find out what was going on, and I had to hurry. There was no time to unstrap the brutal shoes I had once loved with all my heart. I kept my balance by holding on to the wall and moved toward that screaming. I found Joe and Emma outside, next to the hot tub. By then, Emma's screams had dropped to a horrible moan. Joe was standing there, his hands in his pockets, his expression blank. 
He was staring at Marilyn. Marilyn was face down in the hot tub, buffeted back and forth by the swirling water, her hair somehow disgusting and pathetic at the same time, her pale scalp showing through. I didn't know what to do. We probably all would have stood there forever, except that the cops arrived. For a moment, there was only the swish and swirl of the water and the bumping of Marilyn's body hitting the edge of the tub. Finally, one of the cops switched it off. The only sound left was the early morning chirping of the birds. An ambulance arrived and took Marilyn's body away. Then the cops interviewed us together in the living room. I was surprised they kept us together, but I was glad too. The less I had to say, the better. The questions went on for hours, hundreds of questions. Yes, Marilyn had been alive when we left. I didn't remember checking in on her to say goodbye, but I said we had. It seemed important to the cops that we had left her alive. But we had been so wasted the whole time, who could remember? She was strangled, Mr. Flood said, and I snapped to attention. He'd said it so casually that I'd nearly missed hearing him. Emma's jaw dropped and even Joe sat up, shocked. He let go of Emma's hand. But who would kill my mother? Emma asked. My question exactly, the detective said. No one said anything for a while and I chewed on my nails and wondered if anyone would mind if I took off my stupid high-heeled silver sandals. Joe cleared his throat and leaned forward, scratching his head. Spit it out, laddie, the detective said. He had a Scottish accent and a weird scar on his face, as if someone had taken an ax to him. He looked at Joe like he wanted to turn him upside down and shake the answers out of him. I would have shaken Joe myself if it would have got us out of there quicker. I was coming down fast and it wasn't pleasant. I was cold as ice sweating like a bag of peas taken out of the freezer and left on the counter. I hugged myself, trying to stop from shaking. Julia, Joe's voice was hoarse, and I could tell he was hurting too. Emma leaned forward to light a cigarette, inhaled, coughed, and waved a hand through the smoke. Who? the detective asked. Oh, for God's sake, son, just spit it out. We're all dying a slow death here. Julia, Joe said. Julia who, the cop demanded. Julia Sherwin, Emma's former best friend. We saw her last night. Well, Em did. Yeah, I did. Emma nearly inhaled the cigarette to the butt. I swung my foot, trying to hurry everybody along. The pain of my blistered feet was a distraction from my withdrawal, and I bobbed my foot, cutting that strap in deeper. Move the pain, shift the focus. I took a cigarette too, although I hated smoking. You saw this Julia last night? Yes, Emma said, we all saw her. I ran after her, but she disappeared. You people are driving me bloody mad, the detective said. He had said his name was McFaddish or something. Joe, please tell us who Julia is and why she would want to kill Marilyn Hanlon. Only Joe is to talk. The rest of you, shut it. Julia was Emma's best friend, Joe said. Julia had an affair with Emma's father when she was 13. What? Emma screamed. She jumped up and glared at Joe. Like I said, McFaddish or whatever his name was repeated, Joe is talking. Sit down, Emma. Emma sat down, but her face was a weird green color and her lips looked blue. I noticed that her hair was quite stringy and she had somehow gone from slender to addict skinny in the past week. Julia had an affair with your father, Joe said. He looked down and his voice was a monotone. I never told you. Your mother told me. Your parents paid off Julia and her parents to vanish. After Julia told your mother, that she and your father were going to get married. Your mother threatened to have your father arrested for statutory rape. Julia hated your mother, and you said she was here. I saw her. I did. You were right. 
She would want to kill your mother because she was so in love with your father. And you saw this Julia and ran out after her, McFadish asked Emma. Emma was still shaking her head in disbelief over what she heard. I could see her drag her thoughts away from the past and back to McFadish. She nodded. How long were you gone while you ran after her? Emma shook her head. I don't know. I didn't wear a watch. Did you take note of the time? McFadish asked Joe and me, and we shook our heads. I wonder, McFadish said, if maybe you ran back home and strangled your mother while pretending to be looking for this girl who ruined your parents' marriage. I didn't have time to come back here, Emma shouted at him. Ask them. While I was gone, Ellie ate all the nachos, and she eats quickly. Isn't that right, Ellie? I flushed beet red. It seemed pretty darn rude of her to say that. I was aware of the rolls of fat straining at the sequin dress. I sat up straighter and sucked in my gut. I knew I shouldn't have eaten all that food. I had turned Emma off. It was my fault. I was just glad she didn't say I had eaten two whole platters. She was being kind not saying that, and my heart warmed to her. Emma wasn't gone for long. There was a cruise ship in the harbor, Joe said, bringing me back to the moment. You should look there for Julia Sherwin, I mean. That had crossed my mind, laddie, McFadish said dryly. And if you have any other gems to offer, feel free to let me know. What a tangle, he said. But get to the bottom of it, I shall. After he left, it was like we didn't know what to do. We fired up a pipe and got our immediate needs seen to. Then I pulled off the shoes, yanking the bloodied straps out of my feet. I'm going to heat up a pizza, I said, and they nodded. I felt weird, like something was going on between them, and I was the odd man out. It was a horribly familiar feeling, and I didn't like it one bit. I put the pizza in the oven and huddled near the door, trying to listen. I heard Emma laugh and say, my stomach dropped, and I was sure I was right. They were talking about me. I crept even closer. I did well, Emma said, pretending not to know that Julia was screwing dad. She laughed. I deserve an Oscar. I just went back to when I heard it for the first time, and I channeled that. Listen, I know you've been carrying the load, I heard Joe say, but wasn't I right about bringing Ellie along? She said she saw Julia. She backed us up. What a laugh. Yeah, the slug's a good alibi, but I'm so sick of her. Emma said. I wasted so much time and money on her. And the sex, oh God, I don't even want to think about that. The slug? I turned and threw up in the potted plant I was hiding behind. I didn't have much to throw up, just stomach bile. I tucked my body behind the plant and strained to hear more. I heard Emma fire up the pipe again. I ached to join her and pretend I heard, hadn't heard anything, pretend they hadn't called me the slug and used me from the start. It all made sense now. Of course, they would never have cared for a person like me, a slug like me. Where's the rest of the fentanyl, Emma suddenly asked. Fentanyl? Was Emma into that too? Hidden, Joe said. Where's Ellie? She's taking a long time with that pizza. Come on, let's go and get her. We need her to be on board until we're in the clear. I'm not having sex with her anymore, Emma said. You may have to, Joe said. No, I'm too grief-stricken over my mother. And anyway, there's the Julia thing I can say I have to deal with. I'm not in any emotional state to make out with the slug. No sex. I have more than enough excuses. Don't make her suspicious, though, Joe warned. She's too stupid to notice anything. She's in love with you. She'll notice if you suddenly go cold. I can't do it, Emma said. Hit me with your pet shark. Rock the cat's spa. She thinks she's frickin' hilarious with her messed up lyrics, but she's so friggin' stupid. I can't stand it. I hate her, and I hate her stupid music. I was sucker punched. She couldn't have hurt me more. 
Not only was I ugly, I was ridiculous and stupid. I had and trusted her, and she laughed at me. No, worse, she hated me. But I wasn't as stupid as she thought. I tiptoed back into the kitchen and got the pizza out of the oven. I went back into the living room where they were still arguing and pretended not to notice anything. Here, I said to Emma, eat something. Oh, Ellie, Emma rushed over and hugged me. You poor little thing. I stood still in her embrace, and that's when I realized that no matter what she did, I would love her, and I would take whatever love she would give me, even if it was no more than the dregs of her filthy manipulations. Let's put another rock in the pipe, I said. Emma laughed. Sure, sweetie pop. A couple of days passed in a blur of drugs, booze, movies, fast food, and cigarette smoke. I was vaguely aware of McFaddish, or whatever, coming by again. Thank God he hadn't been able to search the house, much to his chagrin. There wasn't enough evidence for him to get a search warrant. Which seemed odd to me. Had he bought into the Julia story? I didn't think he had. But Emma had mentioned something about bringing the hotshot family lawyer into the picture, so maybe he had sorted it. I had no idea and I wasn't worried. Emma and Joe had it all figured out. I knew Emma didn't want to have sex with me, but I also knew she couldn't just go cold, like Joe said, and I worked that to my advantage. I still wanted her. What did I care if I knew she was faking? I wasn't, and in a way I got off on knowing I had the upper hand, knowing what I knew. For the first time in my life, I felt powerful. Of course, if you're all innocent, then why not let us look, McFaddish asked on one of his visits, and Emma laughed and closed the door in his face. We checked the cruise ship manifesto, McFaddish said when he came back yet again. There was no one on board called Julia Sherwin. Maybe she got a fake passport, Joe suggested. McFaddish shrugged. Possibly. He turned to Emma. Your mother had a lethal amount of fentanyl in her system. What do you have to say about that? Ask her doctor, not me, Emma said. We did ask him. My mother was strangled, Emma said, and if she took drugs, that's not on me. McFaddish looked at her like he was waiting for her to confess, but she just let out a shrill, crazy laugh. He turned and left. We still had a week to go on our so-called holiday, and I knew I didn't want to go back to my old life. Joe would stay here with my beautiful Emma, and I would be back in my brown and gray bachelor apartment, going to work and inputting expenses. I'd be all alone. I want to stay here with you two, I said suddenly. Joe looked at me. He looked at Emma, and neither of them said anything. I sat up. I know the truth. I heard what you said. You need me to alibi you. Oh, you little fool, Joe said, and he sounded affectionate. And who is going to believe you? They'll believe me, I stood up, my fists balled at my side. McFaddish will believe me. You are threatening us, you slug? Emma's face turned purple with rage. And it's McFadden, not McFaddish, you friggin' moron. I knew I had made a big mistake. I turned and ran out the French doors, out into the garden past the tub, and crawled under the hedge, wedging myself in tight. I heard Joe and Emma look for me half-heartedly. She won't go to McFadden, Joe said. She's an addict, and who'll believe her? Come on, Em, let's go and take the edge off. What a day, stupid little bitch. I decided to wait until Joe and Emma had passed out, and then get my passport and leave. They were right. Who would believe me? I had to get away, or they would kill me, too. I waited for hours, shivering in the night. I finally went in through the back door and tiptoed through the kitchen. I grabbed a big knife and stood still, listening hard, but there was nothing. They were asleep. I crept down the hallway and nearly dropped the knife in fright when Emma suddenly appeared in front of me like some kind of evil zombie queen. I looked at her. 
Her hair was wild and she was gaunt and ragged and beautiful. I loved her completely, but I didn't hesitate. I rushed at her and shoved the knife into her belly with all my might. I'll hit you with my pet shark, I whispered. I loved you and you betrayed me. I yanked the knife upward and my love and rage rose like vomit in my throat. I looked her right in the eye while I killed her. I swear she looked more surprised than anything else. She crumpled to the floor and I stepped over the blood that puddled over the tiles. I wiped the handle of the knife on my hoodie and went over to Joe, who was out cold, face planted on the plush cream carpet. I put the knife in his hand and pressed his fingers around it. He didn't move a muscle. I ripped off the hoodie and washed up as best I could. I ran into my bedroom and started stuffing things into my suitcase, all the lovely things Emma had bought me. Oddly enough, I found a scarf I thought I'd lost, a white scarf with silver sequins draped over a chair. I looked at it for a moment, wondering how I could have missed seeing it when I searched for it the night we went out on the town, the night Marilyn was killed, and I couldn't find it then. Yet now, there it was. I stuffed it into my case. I was taking all my pretty things. A thought occurred to me. I ran into the sunken living room and grabbed a big bag of rock. Then I raided Marilyn's washroom closet and scooped up her sleeping meds, tranks, and painkillers. I saw her jewelry box on her dressing table and told myself not to be greedy. I took a few gold necklaces, some earrings, and a couple of diamond rings, but there was so much there, I hardly made a dent. But then I stopped. If I left, they'd think I killed them all. If I ran, I looked guilty. I sat down on Marilyn's bedroom floor and tried to think. I was coming down, shaking like a rabbit having a fit. I ran back into the living room and took a hit off the pipe on the coffee table. Joe was still passed out. My head cleared and my nerves settled down. I had no choice. I had to call McFaddish now. I had to pretend I'd wasted no time in calling the cops. I was innocent. I'd been asleep and when I woke up, Joe had killed Emma before he passed out. I ran back to my room and changed into a pair of pajamas that I hadn't bothered to pack. I grabbed my small suitcase and hid it in the laundry room, stacking it neatly behind the ironing board. Joe killed Emma, I told McFaddish when he arrived. They are sick and evil, both of them. They killed Marilyn, too. Joe is passed out in the living room. I don't know why he would have killed Emma. Too many drugs, if you ask me. They're both crack addicts. Cops swarmed the house and I sat in the kitchen where McFaddish had taken me. A uniformed cop kept an eye on me. I was overcome with exhaustion and dozed off, my head on my arms, folded on the table. Breaking news, kiddo. Joe is dead, McFaddish said, shaking me awake. He overdosed. He died at least an hour before Emma died. As those words sank in, I watched him hold out three clear plastic bags. One had my bloodied hoodie in it. The other had a tiny baggie. The third had the knife I'd used to kill Emma. Found the fentanyl in your room, he said, and this hoodie in your suitcase, along with a lot of jewelry that I'm betting isn't yours. And since I'm a betting man, I'm betting this is Emma's blood on your hoodie. You killed Emma. The knife speaks for itself. Rest assured, we're going to check every item in your room and suitcase that you could have used to strangle Marilyn. My money's saying you killed her, too. The scarf. I bet Emma used the scarf to kill her mother and planted it in my room. Joe and Emma were going to set me up, have me as the fall guy if it came down to it. Yet another reason to keep me around so I could take the blame. But would that have made sense to the cops? Why would I have killed Marilyn? Marilyn and her husband had separate wills and Emma's father had cut her out. If anybody had reason to kill Marilyn, it was Emma, not me. And Joe was along for the ride with Emma. 
he also had a motive, whereas I didn't. Marilyn and I liked each other, but no one knew that. Thoughts were spinning around in my messed up brain. Joe and Emma could have said anything to McFaddish, like Marilyn wanted me gone, and so I killed her. They would have thought of a reason, and who'd believe me over them? Why you did it, I don't know, McFaddish continued, and I don't even care. I'm not one of those motive-driven policemen who wants to know why. It's always the same thing anyway. Drugs, money, sex. I just want to know who, and it was you. You got anything to say, girly? But when would I have killed Marilyn, I managed. I was with Joe the whole time in town. Emma was the one who left us. She went looking for Julia, who I never saw. I saw a girl. Emma and Joe pointed to a girl and they said it was Julia, but I don't know who she was. They set me up. McFaddish gave me something that passed for a smile. You all lied. There wasn't any truth whatsoever to any of your stories, so none of that counts. What I've got are three dead bodies and all the evidence points to you. Nice and tidy for me, so thanks for that. I guess I was the one who got shark bit in the end. It was over. The day the music died. Bye-bye, your love was a lie. So I stared at the cop and didn't say a thing. I looked away from the blood-stained hoodie and I looked away from the butcher's knife. I did what dad would have told me to do. I shut it from that point and kept shtum. Not one more word. I did, however, shrug. And that has been Hit Me With Your Pet Shark by Lisa de Nicholas from In the Key of 13, an anthology of crime stories by the Maydams of Mayhem, Carrick Publishing, 2019. I hope you've enjoyed that very unique crime story and that you'll look for more works by Lisa de Nicholas, wherever you can find them. And uh, with that, I bid you farewell for the week with my thanks as always to Ted Carrick for the theme song, Eyes of Gold, and with thanks to all our listeners of Story Stalking and Dead to Rights. I hope you'll join me next week for another story from In the Key of 13.